You walk into a coffee shop, pull out your phone, and tap it against a little square reader. Beep! Your latte is paid for with something called Bitcoin. No cash, no credit card, just invisible internet money. But then the lights flicker, the power goes out, and suddenly everyone is staring at their dead phones like they've forgotten how to buy coffee. So what happens to Bitcoin when the power grid fails? This is where the power grid question becomes really important. All of those computers maintaining the blockchain need electricity to run. The computers solving the math problems to earn new Bitcoin need electricity. The computers processing transactions when you buy your coffee need electricity. In fact, the Bitcoin network uses an absolutely enormous amount of electricity. I mean, we're talking about more electricity than entire countries use. Some estimates say that Bitcoin uses more electricity than Argentina or Norway. There is a lot of power for invisible internet money. So, what happens when the power goes out? Well, it depends on how much power goes out and for how long. If your house loses power, but the rest of the world still has electricity, then Bitcoin keeps working just fine. You can't access your Bitcoin at this time from your dead phone or computer, but the global network of computers maintaining the blockchain keeps on humming along. It's just like if your TV breaks. All the TV shows keep getting made anyway. You just can't watch them until your TV is fixed. But what if a whole city loses power? Or a whole country? Now this is where things get a bit more complicated. Bitcoin is designed to be resilient. The network is spread out across thousands of computers and hundreds of companies. If some of those computers go offline because they lose power, the remaining computers can still keep the network running. The blockchain is like a really stubborn mule. It's designed to keep going even if some of the computers pulling the cart fall down. However, if enough computers go offline at the same time, things start to get wonky. Bitcoin transactions might take longer to process, the network might become slower and more expensive to use, and in extreme cases, if too many computers go offline, the network might actually struggle to function properly. It's like if half the hall monitors in our school example suddenly disappeared. The remaining hall monitors could still finish their job, but they'd be overwhelmed and might miss some things. Now, here's where the future of money people and the it's a scam people start throwing digital punches at each other. The future of money crowd argues that Bitcoin is revolutionary because it doesn't depend on banks or governments. With Bitcoin though, you could theoretically send money to anyone, anywhere in the world, almost instantly without asking anyone's permission. It's like having a universal currency that works everywhere. There's also the volatility issue. Bitcoin's price goes up and down like a roller coaster designed by somebody who really, really likes roller coasters. One day, one Bitcoin might be worth $50,000 and the next, it might only be worth $30,000. Then it might shoot back up to $60,000. Now, that makes it pretty terrible as actual money. The power grid issue also adds another layer to this debate. The future of money people argue that Bitcoin's resilience proves it's superior to traditional banking systems. If there's a major disaster that knocks out power grids, they say, at least Bitcoin will still exist somewhere in the world, ready to spring back to life when the power comes back on. Traditional banking systems, however, rely on centralized servers and infrastructure, and they might be more vulnerable to widespread failures. The it's a scam people, though, counter that with if the power grid fails badly enough, then we'll have much bigger problems than whether our digital money still works. If there's no electricity, there's probably no internet either. And if there's no internet, Bitcoin becomes about as useful as a chocolate teapot. You can't eat Bitcoin, you can't burn it for warmth, and you can't use it to fix your broken water pipes. In a real crisis, they argue people will want food, water, medicine, and shelter, not digital certificates proving that some computer somewhere once solved a math problem. There's also the question of who actually controls Bitcoin. While it is true that no single government or bank controls Bitcoin, it's not exactly a democracy either. The people who own the most powerful computers, the ones solving the math problems and maintaining the blockchain, have a lot of influence over how the network operates. And I don't think these are necessarily the people that we would want making decisions about our money. Some of them are tech billionaires, some are huge corporations, and some are these mysterious entities that no one really knows much about. The environmental impact is another huge point of contention. Bitcoin mining, which is what we call the process of solving those math problems to earn new Bitcoin, requires specialized computers that use enormous amounts of electricity. These computers generate a lot of heat, so they also need powerful cooling systems, which uses even more electricity. Some Bitcoin mining operations look like airplane hangars filled with thousands of humming computers all working around the clock to solve math problems. Critics argue that this is an environmental disaster. All that electricity has to come from somewhere, and in many parts of the world, that means burning fossil fuels. So Bitcoin isn't just using a lot of electricity, it's potentially contributing to climate change. Supporters counter that Bitcoin mining can actually help renewable energy development by providing a use for excess energy that would otherwise be wasted. But this argument is still hotly debated. Then there's the criminal activity angle. 
Because Bitcoin transactions are relatively anonymous and don't require approval from banks or governments, Bitcoin has become popular with criminals. Drug dealers, ransomware attacks, and other unsavory characters often demand payment in Bitcoin because it's harder to trace than traditional money. This has led some governments to crack down on Bitcoin, which creates regulatory uncertainty that makes some people nervous about investing in it. The power grid question also raises interesting points about centralization versus decentralization. While Bitcoin is designed to be decentralized, meaning no single entity controls it, the reality is much more complicated. Bitcoin mining tends to concentrate in areas where electricity is cheap, which means that a relatively small number of mining operations in a few countries control a large portion of the network's computing power. If those areas lose power, it could significantly impact the entire Bitcoin network. This is different from traditional banking, which is centralized in a different way. Banks have backup systems, redundant data centers, and disaster recovery plans specifically designed to keep operating during power outages and other emergencies. They use backup generators, battery systems, and can even operate with paper records if necessary. Bitcoin, being entirely digital, doesn't have these kinds of fallback options. Then there's also the question of accessibility during power outages. Even if the Bitcoin network keeps on running somewhere in the world, regular people need working devices and internet connections to access their Bitcoin. During major disasters, cell towers go down, internet cables get cut, and people's phones and computers run out of battery. In these situations, physical cash starts to look pretty appealing. I mean, you can't pay for emergency supplies with Bitcoin if your phone is dead and the store's payment systems are down. Some Bitcoin enthusiasts, though, have proposed solutions to the power grid problem. They talk about satellite networks that could keep Bitcoin transactions flowing even if ground-based internet infrastructure fails. They imagine solar-powered Bitcoin mining operations that could keep running even during grid outages. Some even envision a future where Bitcoin transactions could be transmitted over radio waves or other communication methods that don't rely on traditional internet infrastructure. But critics point out that these solutions are largely theoretical and would require massive investments in infrastructure that don't currently exist. They argue that it's easier to just use money that doesn't require electricity and internet connections to function. The debate over Bitcoin often comes down to different visions of the future. Bitcoin supporters see a world where people have more control over their money, where financial transactions make global commerce easier and more efficient. They see Bitcoin as a hedge against government mismanagement of traditional currencies and a way to protect wealth from inflation and political instability. Bitcoin critics see a speculative bubble built on environmental destruction and powered by greed and technophobia. They see a system that benefits early adopters and tech-savvy investors at the expense of regular people and the environment. They worry that Bitcoin's volatility and complexity make it unsuitable as actual money, and they fear that its association with criminal activity and its lack of consumer protections make it dangerous for ordinary people to use. The power grid issue, though, is really just one part of a much larger question about whether Bitcoin represents genuine innovation or just a high-tech version of old-fashioned speculation. Both sides, though, make compelling arguments, and the truth probably lies somewhere in between. So, let's recap this whole digital money adventure. Bitcoin is basically a really complicated way of keeping track of who solves math problems, and people have decided that these solutions are valuable. It lives entirely on computers that need electricity, so when the power goes out, things get complicated. Some people think it's the future because it doesn't need banks or governments, while others think that it's a scam because it uses tons of electricity to do nothing useful, and its price bounces around like a caffeinated kangaroo. Whether it survives power outages depends on how many computers stay online, but if the lights go out everywhere, you might want to keep some regular money in your piggy bank just in case. Now go forth and confuse your friends with your newfound knowledge of invisible internet money. Just don't blame me when they start asking you to explain cryptocurrency at dinner parties.